Okay. Next talk is by Frank Tong. Frank uh, did her, his PhD at Harvard and then did a short postdoc at UCLA and became faculty at Princeton and then moved to uh, Vanderbilt in uh, Tennessee. And Frank uh, has introduced a completely different way of doing fMRI data analysis, which is instead of looking at the average activity of bunch of voxels or the, of the activity of individual voxels is looking at the distributed activity across voxels. And we'll see what we present. Thank you, Franco. And uh, thanks very much to the organizers of this uh, wonderful conference. It's uh, been a really exciting and a, a great learning experience for me uh, since the beginning of the session. Um, I was wondering, could we turn down the lights just a little bit? Not too much, but just a little bit downward. Thanks. Um, so. I, this talk is both a mixture of general, more, more, more general background and also more specifics on the science. And I thought, starting with a more general perspective, uh, and also following our previous speaker, uh, Uri Hassan, why not start with uh, a story as well? Uh, let's start with a, a science fiction story. I'll call the science fiction story number one. Um, imagine that by measuring patterns of brain activity from the human brain, it is possible to determine precisely what a person is looking at. So here we have a subject and we've um, strapped this person into the scanner. Uh, they've kindly volunteered to stay in the scanner for the next day or two. Uh, they're outfitted with an IV, possibly a catheter or a bedpan, and uh, we're just presenting lots of images to the subject and, and have managed to get clearance from IRB somehow. And, uh, and after scanning lots of brain pictures, we present a randomly selected image and poof, here it is. And uh, we look at the person's brain activity and we say, aha, yes, indeed, it is it is the painting uh, done in an impressionist style with the apples, the plate below, the vase, Cezanne-like, but not actually painted by, Ze Ze painted by Cezanne. It is indeed Louvre painting 1049 with 99% confidence. We will try to identify this painting. Uh, would this uh, be an impressive feat or not? And if we could do this, does this necessarily indicate that we understand the neural code for vision? I'm not going to answer this question right now, but just keep that in mind. Now let's shift gears a little bit. We'll switch to a second story, science fiction story number two. And uh, imagine if by measuring a person's brain activity, uh, it could reveal what item is being attended. So uh, just before this talk, I just randomly selected an image from Google Images, and I want to figure out which of these two objects captures your uh, attention. And uh, lo and behold, this, this image was actually created uh, before uh, Bristol Palin appeared on Dancing with the Stars. Um, uh, and and so, so would it be possible to scan your brain, even if your eyes were fixed like, like one of John Monsell's monkeys? Could we scan your brain and know which of these two entities better captures your attention? Or let's say through a very uh, unusual and special intimate act of bipartisanship, these two individuals now become fused and occupy a single spatial location. Uh, would it be possible to scan your brain and tell which of these two objects you're focusing your attention on? And uh, as a final variant of, of what I like to call uh, mind reading, uh, Imagine if we present you an image, and uh, it's very salient, uh, but then it goes away quietly for a time, you know, memoirs aside. You know, could we scan your brain and know when that image is being held in your mind or not? So stepping back to science fiction story number one, that of brain reading, uh, it turns out that this experiment uh, has been done. And, uh, and a striking example of this was done by Jim Haxby and colleagues. Uh, and, uh, what he did was he measured core scale activity patterns in the ventral temporal cortex. And uh, these regions tend to like uh, various types of objects or respond well in general to objects. And they wanted to know whether it would be possible to predict what category of object the person was looking at. And they showed various categories, faces, houses, cats, bottles, scissors, shoes, and so forth. And uh, it has been known for a long time that there are certain hot spots in these object areas. For example, there's a, there's a face hot spot that you, you'll hear, uh, hear more about from Vinrick. Uh, there's also a region that responds strongly to, say, houses, but there's not really a bottle region or a shoe or chair region of the, of the brain. And so what you might observe in these studies, and I'm just going to show you a cartoon. Let's say you show a bunch of chairs, a bunch of shoes, and you measure this pattern of activity. And at a gross level, uh, in a given region, maybe there's not uh, much difference in amplitude of activity for, say, chairs and shoes. But if you look at a finer scale, there's sort of this, this undulating topology varying over the scale of, say, several millimeters. And the undulations look a little bit different here than here. Uh, is that just noise, or is there any reliability to those variations? Uh, what you can do is you can look at the spatial pattern of activity on one set of runs and 
create these, sort of these average templates. You could call this the, the training template. And you want to then predict what the person's seeing on a subsequent set of runs. And uh, you can do that by just doing, say, simple correlation or more fancy analysis. And what Haxby colleagues found was that these correlations were positive, whereas the correlations across categories tended to be lower, hovering around zero. And on this basis, they could predict with good accuracy what category uh, the person was looking at. And so how do we understand this type of performance, and to what extent can we push this, what I will call, brain reading uh, game here? Uh, we're well, looking at the organization of the visual cortex, and David Heger gave a, a, a very nice outline of, of, of its organization. We know that um, there's a detailed retinotopic map uh, that separates the different early visual areas and even the higher visual areas. So here I'm showing the right hemisphere. This is the occipital pole. This is an inflated brain, so you can see inside the sulci. Uh, this would be the primary visual cortex here, representing uh, this portion of the visual field. And you have the, the early areas. And Haxby and colleagues was looking at the, the ventral surface anterior to these strongly retinotopic regions. And uh, these regions respond more to complex objects uh, than to just simple patterns. So we have different levels of representation where there's sort of uh, object codes in these higher areas. We have strong retinotopy on the scale of centimeters in the early visual areas. But if we zoom in at a very fine scale, um, if we could say look at just uh, a single small chunk here, and we were to enlarge that, this is a optical columns that were actually imaged uh, in the macaque monkey. Uh, we know that at this very fine scale, there are cortical columns sensitive to orientation. We would like to, ideally, maybe find a way to read out these fine scale signals as well, not just retinotopic signals. But whether this would be possible with neuroimaging in the human uh, remained an open question at the time. And so, how should we try to measure these brain signals and understand them? Uh, a traditional approach or, or a very uh, useful approach is to think about how uh, a visual stimulus strikes the eye and is encoded by the visual system. So the retina has these sort of circular center surround receptive fields, as does the lateral geniculate, and orientation selectivity emerges in V1, or um, direction selectivity in V1, and very prominently in area MT, for instance. Then would it be possible to read these signals in certain brain areas, such as V1, and decode what visual pattern, feature, or object the person is seeing. Decoding is sort of the reverse property of trying to look at the brain signals and infer something either about the stimulus or, in a more interesting case, I will argue, the person's mental state. And that's what we'll be talking about here. So focusing on the problem of orientation, because uh, this is a very hard thing to do uh, in neuroimaging. As a neuroimager, I, I should admit, uh, is that, that a lot of us suffer from uh, electrophysiology envy. We really wish we could put electrodes into normal human brains and record individual neurons. But unfortunately, uh, that's not feasible nor ethical. And so we'd like to find other ways to, uh, to get around this and try to measure and approach a little bit of the selectivity that's possible uh, with, with uh, neurophysiology methods. And uh, I was very lucky to have a postdoc in my lab, Yukiasu Kamatani, who came up with the idea of, do you think we could uh, try and decode visual orientation? And he developed a method to, to try and do this. What we did was we presented eight different possible orientations uh, in the first study we did, uh, showed it to the subject, and we measured the patterns of activity using these crude fMRI voxels, three by three by three millimeter voxels from the visual cortex. And we used uh, linear classifiers to try to classify which of the eight orientations we thought was most likely to be there. And at the final stage, we just had a simple nonlinear step. Whatever um, discriminant function had the greatest activity level, we would make a prediction saying, oh, let's try to guess that it was that of the orienta eight orientations that was physically presented. Um, I will show this briefly since we have a little bit of time just to explain the math of uh, classification. And, and John Montz already alluded to this. So uh, if we had just two voxels, uh, basically we would have a, a multi-dimensional space and with n voxels this just becomes an n-dimensional space. And in this multi-dimensional space, the response to any given uh, orientation could be plotted as a single point. And what we have are sort of clouds of dots that represent the the pattern of activity to different orientations. And you can use a variety of decision rules or uh, uh, methods to classify, linearly classify the data, separating it using this uh, hyperplane. 
And this method's linear because the hyperplane is, is, is a flat thing with a single vector as, a, as the discriminant function. And uh, in, in, our, in our hands, uh, a variety of methods work, and we, we tend to prefer uh, support vector machines. So when we ran this study in the scanner, uh, and we showed subjects uh, each of eight possible orientations, we were very surprised when we tried to classify the orientations, and this was how well we could predict from the activity patterns. And so how is this possible, given that orientation columns reside at the scale of submillimeter structures, and we were measuring signals from the visual cortex using these large, clunky 3 by 3 by 3 millimeter voxels. Uh, it took a long time, actually, not to get this basic analysis or to succeed at decoding. What took us a lot longer was figuring, how is this decoding possible? And Yuki came up with a, a, a very clever idea. So here, I'm just for illustration, I'm superimposing 3 by 3 millimeter voxels on this surface here. And imagine that, and this is actually the, the response of a example, example voxel. You can see that it's strongly responding to each of the orientations and has a small undulation. If we did a statistical test, it would not be significantly uh, different in its response to the different orientations. Nonetheless, maybe the small undulation reflects a weak, a very small but weak amount of true information, a true preference of the voxel. Uh, how would we know that's true? It might be hard to know from any single voxel, but let's say in this voxel there happens to be 51 versus 49 vertical to horizontal columns. In this one, 52 to 48, this one 50-50, this one 49-51, and so forth. Each voxel would provide just a teeny amount of information, but if the response of each voxel is, is largely independent, then pooling the information from many voxels could lead to a robust prediction of what orientation the person is seeing. And in essence, that's what we think we're doing, that due to the random variability in the local distribution of these columns, um, unlike Hubel and Wiesel's sort of famous ice cube model, these organic structures have you know, a, a fine structure, but also natural variability. So in any given voxel, there may be slightly more of one column or another. And so this is our notion. Uh, can we test and elaborate on this? Uh, more recently, a postdoc in my lab Yasha Swisher, uh, devised a multi-scale pattern analysis method to try to address what the scale of the information is that resides in the cortex that we're reading out with fMRI. And what we'll do, I'm just going to focus on the cat data for the purpose of this talk. Uh, we analyzed data from Sungji Kim's group where they could actually isolate the orientation columns of the cat. And what we're going to do is we'll high pass or low pass filter the data into higher low spatial frequency bands and say, well, do we still find orientation information? And if so, how much is there? And the human data were largely consistent uh, with the cat data. So the key point here is that uh, when we low pass filter the, the, the data, you can see that here you can see the columns. With a bit of low pass filtering, you can still see them. And with more severe filtering, the columns go away. Nonetheless, the colors indicated on this map indicate a statistically reliable orientation bias in that region even though you can see the columnar structures obliterated with severe low-pass filtering. What happens in terms of the overall orientation information we extract when we apply pattern classification to these activity patterns, either the original image or these filtered images that lose that fine scale information, is a, a graceful degradation or a gradual loss of orientation information. But it doesn't go away all at once. Uh, it persists up to very coarse scales on the order of millimeters. And it is at these scales that we believe we're picking up the signals in human visual cortex. So the, uh, the take home message for, for here is that we believe that orientation columns uh, can be wa well modeled by, um, this is some fancy jargon for the, the more general audience, uh, bandpass filtered noise. And so although it has a lot of power at these fine scales, uh, the power extends to lower spatial frequencies. And due to the random variability of columnar structures, we believe that decoding can detect the existence of signals from columnar structures. However, the converse is not true. If you can successfully decode, let's say, color or, or some other feature or, or theory of mind from a brain region, that doesn't mean it's represented in a columnar fashion in that region. Uh, however, if columns exist in that region, you may be able to decode a signal from that region. Uh, since this study and our ability to decode orientation, there have been two really, I think, interesting and key studies uh, on sort of just brain reading and demonstrations of it. This is a study by uh, Yuki Kamatani, my former postdoc, and his lab uh, that he did, where he was trying to reconstruct what people saw 
uh, showing them patterns and reading out their brain activity. And uh, here, it's largely going to be based on retinotopy rather than orientation. Uh, retinotopy provides a much better, better segregated signal. Uh, but you can see here, this is the, uh, the image that they're showing the subject. And here you can see the image that they're reconstructing from the brain activity uh, as to what they think the person saw. And uh, using a, a decoding method, you can see that the reconstructions on a trial by trial basis are you know, not too bad. They could identify what letter or what pattern the person saw with reasonably good accuracy, I think, in the study on the order of 80% or so. In a, in a related study, uh, Jack Allen's group, um, they used a, a forward encoding model, which I won't go into the details of, but essentially they're going to uh, use a set of intermediate basis functions, Gabor wavelets, and then try to uh, figure out how individual fMRI voxels respond to various portions of the visual field and various orientations and so forth. And based on the pattern of activity they observe in the brain, they'll then try to predict which of, let's say, uh, several natural images a person was shown. And the feat was pretty impressive. 110 of 120, or 1, 000, uh, 820 correctly out of 1,000 possible images for the subject. So really, really impressive um, classification uh, or identification. You could call this essentially the experiment of decoding Louvre painting 1049. That said, these demonstrations being very cool, in a sense, we're not gathering more information than we had before. You could look over, you could, you know, scan the person's brain, and yes, clearly, they're looking at Louvre painting 1049, or you could just look over them, oh, it's Louvre painting 1049. You didn't need a multi-million dollar scanner or these fancy analyses to determine this information. Um, that is not the case when we talk about mental events, subjective mental events that are private and uh, not, not evident from the external stimulus. So uh, here, I'll, I'll like to focus on some studies where we decode the contents of visual attention. Here you can see examples of over-attention where let's say a person's looking at you or not. We move our eyes all the time, but we can also keep our eyes still and uh, use the force, you might say, and attend to different things. So if you were, let's say, attending this beer gate summit and focusing on the, the clinking beer glasses, you could nonetheless use your covert attention while keeping your eyes fixed on the beer and attend to, in the periphery, each of these three gentlemen. Um, in the case of these overlapping sets of lines, you could uh, attend to, let's say, the left tilted or right tilted lines. And in this case of perhaps object-based attention, you could attend to the, the vase between the two faces or the, the two uh, people here uh, wearing sombreros. And this, this gentleman has a guitar. You might be able to see there. Uh, there are many objects in this complex image. So, uh, focusing on feature-based attention briefly, uh, in our original study, we were curious whether feature-based attention might bias activity in early visual areas. So using a similar method, we tried to see whether we could decode what orientation the person was uh, paying attention to. And first, we trained the classifier on single orientations, tilted to the left or to the right. And in this ambiguous state, subjects uh, had to attend to one or the other image, and we tried to read out their attentional state. And what we found was that pulling the activity across areas V1 through V4, we could predict which of the two oriented patterns were being attended with near 80% accuracy. And in each of V1 through V4, we found reliable bias effects of attention. What does that mean? It means that when we try to select one of two orientations, when we cannot rely on spatial attention to, to sort of have a spotlight shining on, on one set of orientations versus the other, we can nonetheless boost the orientation signal. And this signal feeds back to the early stages of orientation processing, starting in the primary visual cortex. More recently, uh, we've been interested in the problem of object-based attention. And although uh, there's been quite a bit of psychophysical research and some fMRI studies, we still don't have a good understanding of the, the neural mechanisms that underlie the selection process. Uh, in some early work, uh, Nancy Canwisher and colleagues showed that when subjects attend to, let's say, either the face or the house, you get biased activity in high-level category selective object areas. So as I alluded to before, uh, in the human, you can find a, a very strong face selective region, the fusiform face area, that responds predominantly to faces as compared to a variety of stimuli. Uh, another region, the parapocampal place area, responds more to houses, landmarks, uh, indoor and outdoor scenes as compared to common objects or faces. And when subjects pay attention to, let's say, the face, you see boosted activity in the face area. When they pay attention to the house, you see boosted activity in the parapocampal place area. Is the enhanced activity in these high-level areas the basis for this selection process? or? 
is, is something else going on here? And we want to ask whether feedback signals from high-level object areas might uh, feed back to these early visual areas, thereby providing a mechanism for object-based selection. And this is work done with uh, postdoctoral fellow Elias Cohen. Another thing that we wanted to ask is whether it might be possible to relate attentional signals in high-level areas and early areas. This is kind of a complicated problem because the two areas like totally different things. The high-level areas like uh, complex objects and the early areas basic visual features. Would decoding potentially provide a way to link up these very different types of signals across brain areas? So uh, we designed these, these sets of stimuli for the task where the, the, the face and the house were presented in a circular window spatially overlapping and subjects would receive a cue saying attend to face or attend to house. Uh, the meaning of the cue was reversed part way so that the, uh, the cue itself couldn't be decoded. Um, and uh, what we did first, what I'll show you is the decoding of the single stimuli. So even though these stimuli are physically overlapping, they do consist of different features in disparate locations, and we can decode which of the two object categories the person's looking at very well in each of the early visual areas, as well as high-level areas. Here I'm going to combine the activity pattern across the fusiform face area and parapocampal place area for the purposes of decoding. <clears throat> Next, we ask, can we decode in this overlapping case, whether you're paying attention to faces or houses, you're seeing the same thing in both cases. And if from the outside, I can't tell what you're doing. Um, I'm hoping you're doing the task, and then we are going to scan your brain and see whether, indeed, your activity is biased in favor of face or house. And what we find is that we can decode which of the two object categories is being attended well above chance. And this bias effect emerges again early on in V1 and is evident in each of the early visual areas. And finally, we can train a classifier on this difference between face and house for single objects and then test it in this attentional condition and see whether it generalizes well. And indeed, the generalization is very good. So from this, we conclude that object-based attention involves a biasing of activity in all early visual areas. Next, we wanted to ask, might the bias signal in these high-level areas be related to the bias signal found in early areas? And I'm going to explain to you the steps of this analysis briefly. Just as illustration, imagine this is a pattern of brain activity. I'm just showing you two sample voxels. We're going to train a classifier on the single stimulus cases, single face and single house, and set up a decision uh, plane to separate uh, evidence for house and evidence for face. And that's how we'll get our, our hyperplane. Now, each of the dots here are data from, let's say, an attention trial where the subject attended to the, the uh, house shown in blue or attended to the face shown in red. And let's say this was a given trial. How strongly was attention bias in favor of the house? We can estimate this bias strength in terms of the length of this distance from this point to the hyperplane. That's how strongly it was biased, this metric here. Now the question is whether across brain areas, tri on trials where you had a really strong bias in the high level areas, do you also find a stronger bias in the early visual areas? Is this, uh, is this length correlated with this distance there? And we're going to do this where every single data point is a block of 16 second trials, um, sorry, a, a 16 second block consisting of four trials, and we've got lots of data points for every subject, and we'll do this analysis. And uh, th this analysis is a bit reminiscent of, of uh, also uh, the data report by John Monsell. We're trying to link uh, behavior uh, or, or, let's say, attentional bias signals uh, on a trial-by-trial -trial basis, except here we're linking across, across disparate brain areas. What's interesting here is that when, not only do we find a correlation across the two conditions, within a condition, here subjects are trying to tend to face every time or trying to tend to house. Behaviorally, they're really good at the task of performing at about 95% accuracy. Nonetheless, on trials where you're trying to attend to faces, when you have a stronger bias signal in your high-level areas, you also tend to have a stronger bias signal in your early visual areas, and conversely, with, or similarly, when attending to house. And this was true for um, each of the six subjects that we, uh, that we tested. Um, very reliable bias effects and a relationship between early areas and high-level areas. 
So finally, to, uh, to, to wrap up, I'd like to talk about a, a final case uh, of mind reading. It's kind of cool that we can read out what people are paying attention to and have ideas of mechanisms that might be involved. Uh, but it'd be very interesting if we could decode uh, what people are thinking about visually when nothing's on the screen at all. So imagine if we could scan a person's brain and try to guess you know, what pattern they're thinking of. If we could predict this with some accuracy, uh, that would be uh, interesting and suggestive. And this was work done with graduate student Stephanie Harrison. To give her a flavor of this task, uh, what is it like to remember orientation? I'm going to show a grading, and half a, after a delay, I'll show a second grading, rotated either counterclockwise or clockwise relative to the first. Okay? And so, ready? Everyone's ready? I'm going to show the first grading. How many people think clockwise? And how many think counterclockwise? Okay. So you can all sign up to be scanned after this study. Um, it, so it turns out that this task, uh, people are very good at it. Um, our working memory for orientation is remarkably accurate, uh, typically within a few degrees, even after many delays of many seconds. And usually, you know, people think working memory, frontal lobe, maybe parietal lobe, not visual cortex, and certainly not V1, uh, because evidence of delay, a sustained delay period activity in these regions is, is, has been pretty weak or, or often negligible in a variety of studies, including studies by uh, David Heger's lab. Nonetheless, we decided to persevere on and try to look at uh, whether we'd find any evidence of orientation-specific memory uh, during a working memory task. Now, to separate stimulus-driven activity from memory-related activity, we had to come up with a little trick, and this is what we came up with. Let's, rather than showing one grading, show two gratings that are neuroorthogonal. They can jitter around a bit. And then afterwards, we present subject with a cue saying which one to keep holding on to. You don't know which one to attend to before. You have to remember both. And then you just keep holding on to one after you get the cue. So this tells you, hold on to the second grading. And then after a long delay, where we're measuring fMRI activity, we can now present the test grading. We'll look at fMRI activity before this test pattern appears, so there's no contamination of the brain's response. We're trying to measure a pure memory signal during this period. And uh, so we're going to see how well we can decode which of the two orientations were retained in memory. And if we can decode it above chance, that would indicate the presence of some memory-related information in that brain area. If we pool the activity across V1 through V4, we could decode in one study with 83% accuracy which of the two gradings were held in memory. In a second experiment, it was as high as 86, uh, sorry, 83 in this, 86 in another. And in each of the areas, V1 through V4, we found reliable information. For Visually unattended gradings that just kind of flash by, if we trained a classifier on those and tried to classify the remembered item, performance is somewhat worse, but nonetheless well above chance and very reliable in V1 and V2. Well, so that suggests that information is sustained in these early areas during working memory. What's the time course of this information that we find? What we could do, since we had pretty good memory-related signals in these areas, is try to classify the brain imaging data on a time point by time point basis. Every two seconds that we scan and take a picture of the person's brain, let's make a new prediction and say, what orientation are they holding on to? What orientation? And as you can see, this is when the gradings are shown, the cue appears, there's a delay in the hemodynamic response, so it takes a while before we can predict, but we can see that we can predict and sustain this prediction throughout this delay period. We had a really long delay of 15 seconds, and throughout this delay, the information is maintained in the brain. If instead we ask subjects after showing these two gradings and say, giving a cue saying, report immediately what orientation you see, there is no bias. So it's really particular to maintaining that information in your mind throughout the delay. And this is a performance for decoding in, in V1 alone. In, in this case, we, we did really, really well. The final puzzle I want to mention is uh, why hasn't there been, there been more evidence of this delay period activity from earlier studies of, of visual working memory? And what we did was we compared the bold amplitude, the overall activity level in visual cortex during these delays, and how much information we could read out from the detailed activity pattern. Um, interestingly, we had two groups of subjects that seemed to separate uh, in their bold amplitude. In three subjects, activity went up for the test stimulus, and then it came back down, and it was not reliably greater than baseline late in the delay period. And this is a response to the, the, the second grading, the test grading. In three other subjects, activity was significantly above baseline all the way through the delay period, even late in the delay period. Nonetheless, 
average decoding performance was equally good for this group as for this group. My brain was, uh, in terms of bold activity, was out the wazoo. I was like trying to maintain super vivid imagery, and the activity would go way, way up, and it would stay way, way, way high. You'd think I was looking at flickering checkerboards. Nonetheless, I could decode no better than any of the other subjects. Uh, oh yeah, and so this is the decoding performance for this group and this group on a time point by time point basis. So what we see here is a dissociation between the overall amplitude uh, measured with fMRI across the visual cortex and the information we find in the detailed pattern, suggesting that working memory information might be preserved with very low metabolic activity levels and maintained in sort of a detailed pattern. Why might that be? We don't really know. One possibility is um, it might be metabolically more efficient. Another is maybe when you're thinking about something visually, you don't want your neurons to be so active that you'll be blind to strong stimuli that would suddenly appear in your world. You don't want those two to um, impact on one another. And maybe a final possibility is that when you send these feedback signals to uh, sustain these activity patterns in early areas, maybe there's sort of a balance of excitation and inhibition. We, we don't really know uh, is the short answer. But clearly, there's a lot of information there that has not been found before. So to conclude, we believe that fMRI decoding is a powerful method that can detect orientation selective responses originating from cortical columns due to their sort of band pass nature. And in some cases, it can be used to facilitate the comparison of cognitive signals in distinct brain areas, almost a feat of comparing, say, apples and oranges. Uh, studies from our lab and, and other groups, uh, in particular Jack Lantz and, and Yuki Kamatani, shows that you can really extract a lot of detailed information about what was seen, what I would like to call brain reading. But perhaps even more interesting is that we can probe cognitive states and cognitive functions and reveal uh, these, these high le higher level functions. And this work uh, provides, I think, interesting new evidence showing the importance of early visual areas, not just for perception, but for top-down mechanisms of attentional selection and working memory. Uh, I'd like to uh, acknowledge the, the lab members who, who, who made this work possible and my sources of funding. Thank you. Okay, we have time for one quick question and then we have coffee break. Uh, yeah, I wanted to know if the weights for the decoder of the memories were the same that were calculated for the responses, or if you retrained the, the classifier. Yes, yeah, so, so they, they, they were uh, somewhat different, and what you saw was the generalization performance where we trained, uh, you saw the, the pure green line was training and classifying on working memory, and the black line you saw was training on the uh, stimulus-driven orientation activity, and then classifying the, the remembered activity. Uh, so they're, they're somewhat different, but sufficiently similar that, that you get above chance classification. But th there are differences, and why those exist and to what extent we don't fully understand. One thing that we do know is that even if you take really, say, high contrast gradings of, let's say, 100% and you try to generalize to 10%, it, it's good, but it's not as good as, say, being at 10% and testing on 10%. So there's some weird... I shouldn't say weird. There, there, there's sometimes when you go from a very highly differentiated signal to another one that the weights aren't exactly the same, uh, but they're they're similar. That, right. That's my short answer. Yeah. 